You know when you copy something and the duplicate looks somewhat more regrettable? That is the manner by which I feel about Mean Young Ladies, 2024. It's an impression of the 2004 work of art, an occasionally fun one, in any case, far more regrettable in each respect. We should move this, this is a melodic. I's not terrible in light of the fact that it's a melodic, it's simply a terrible one. The tunes are quite horrible, I can't recall a solitary song from any of them. They generally sound excessively level and handled, and blended awfully, no two-part harmonies or troop tunes possibly, they all vibe intended to be pop melodies, which is positively a horrible method for composing tunes for a melodic. Furthermore, the tunes don't propel the plot by any means, frequently zeroing in on superficial parts of a scene. Additionally, the verses are only absolutely terrible. Why start hot as a tribute to Halloween, however at that point totally leave that tomfoolery premise and have it sound like a conventional EDM pop tune? Why sing Dominant Hunter that grinding way? Also, this film comes up short on famous score and signature music from the first, aside to help you to remember the better film momentarily. The majority of the scenes essentially feel quiet and to be honest, sort of abnormal. Abnormal is presumably the most effective way to portray a great deal of the exhibitions. Large numbers of them are impressions of the first, and keeping in mind that some are enjoyable, B.B. Wood gives a good impression of Lacey Chabert's Gretchen Weiner's, yet without the hyper power. Avanthika is charming and entertaining on occasion as Karen, yet additionally acts completely feeble-minded, not at all like Seyfried, who truly adapted the job. Every one of the characters' base viewpoints are dialed up to 11, which makes me suspect the authors didn't grasp them in any case. Three stick out, Katie, played by Angry Rice, caused me to acknowledge how fabulous Lindsay Lohan was as the person a long time back. Coming up short on an interior portrayal, given to Damien and Janice, which suits a phase play yet not a film, she's an exhausting and dead person, played by Rice, who frequently appears to be awkward in the job and honestly, can't sing. Also her associations with the plastics, and even Janice and Damien never truly feel genuine. The possibly time she's persuading is the point at which she's pining over Christopher Briney's Aaron Samuels, who is incredibly even less a presence here than in the first. Janice, Ollie Cavalho, is maybe the most illustrative of how slim and frail the composition and exhibitions are. Not in the least does Cavalho not measure up to the gnawing, underground rock substance of Lizzie Kaplan's Janice, yet she's an unbiasedly more terrible person. O.G. Janice was enchanting and shrewd, however we as a whole perceived that she actually needed to be enjoyed and was profoundly wounded by Regina. Indeed, even while abhorring her, she needed to essentially be considered by Regina. Here, typically, Janice is easily cool, certain, and has none of the interior haziness the first did. Also, that they wind up making her a lesbian, which nullifies the whole purpose of the person. Janice looked and acted a specific way, not as a result of her sexuality, but rather on the grounds that that is what her identity was. The uncover that she is, truth be told, straight, wasn't an incrimination of lesbianism. It just reminds us not to make suspicions about individuals. And afterward there's Renee Rapp's Regina George. Oh rapture. Rachel McAdams was certainly not a famous antagonist since she was mean, which is what the authors appear to have thought with this new form. She was brilliant, determined, very mindful of her power and honor, and unafraid to use it. Renee strolls down the lobbies and sings about how incredible she is, yet never shows the unpleasantness or the power that Regina should have. They mellowed her personality so much that it's difficult to accept she'd do a large portion of the horrendous things individuals say she did, frankly. Rap seems to be Regina, yet she simply doesn't hold a light. The whole content misses the mark on unpleasantness and nibble of the first, which is centered to its personality, it was regularly depicted as a dull satire. That content was close to consummate, so layered with characters, notable lines, scenes, elements. This content feels restrained, innocuous, and weak. At the point when they, every now and again, retry scenes in this one, they're in every case more terrible. At the point when they revamp scenes, they're in every case more awful. Indeed, even the side characters, such a necessary piece of causing North Shore to feel genuine, 
just make an appearance to say their notable lines and leave. They likewise, consistently, look way better compared to the first individuals in their jobs. The whole purpose in that projecting was to cause mean young ladies to feel genuine, that revolting and lovely individuals coincide in these spaces, and tragically, there is an ordered progression there. At the point when everybody looks pleasant, when everybody appears to be similarly certain, when the film doesn't investigate the elements of the plastics or the social progressive system of secondary school, when the unseemly minutes like the racial clubs and mentor car and Ms. Norberry being a miserable separated from woman, and not cheerfully hitched, in what feels like fan administration for it, the film simply feels like what a ton of current revamps want to come up short on, soul of the first. To summarize how awful the composing is, they have Damien in a real sense say, just Katie might have composed that, in the, honestly entertaining, diversion of the last consume book scene. A second that was suggested through looks between characters should be clarified for the crowd here.